Dark Wood is a very accurate map name. As soon as you leave the spawn area, you are greeted with this lit up road, but when you get past the police car, you are facing off against the darkness and foliage. When those two things are combined, you're fucked! Died many times from not being able to see. Top. I hugged the wall over to the right and took my time killing the commons. The bots can see through the foliage, but I can't. Eventually, we come across a cabin in the woods, and I camp in there until the first random horde spawns in. I'd rather be in an enclosed area and fight the horde rather than in the woods where the commons can come from any direction. After the random horde had been dealt with, I moved on to the next landmark. Again, I'm going to wait until the horde spawns in before I move on, which they did. Rinse and repeat. This is how I beat chapter 1 of Dark Ward on Expert Realism. Move to a landmark, wait until the random horde spawns in, and then do it again with the next landmark, and the next, and the next. If you don't do this, you run the risk of a random horde spawning on top of you, which will lead to your death or a lot of damage taken. Once you make it past all of these landmarks, you'll find this suspicious pathway that leads to a cave. On the way there, some crows will make a bunch of noise and summon a crescendo event, which will only end when the survivors reach the cave. Coming out of the cave led us to a tank. After he's done, we move on to this area that is so tight and small, I was starting to feel claustrophobic. A couple more zombies are killed, and then we reach the safe room, bringing an end to chapter 1. Here are my thoughts. It's not fun. Darkness and foliage combined will never be fun. It's challenging, but not impossible. Nothing really stood out to me in this chapter. Nothing memorable. It's an okay chapter overall. Mediocre at best. I wish I had more to say about this, but don't worry. The later chapters, I will have a lot to say. And it won't be pretty, but it won't be terrible either. Chapter 2 is fairly different from the last. First of all, we've got sunlight emitting into this room. Actually, there was light coming into this room as well. This always confused me because I thought this campaign took place during the night. I mean, you never go outside in chapter 2. So it could be that it's daytime during this chapter. No, wait. It is actually daytime. And you do go outside at one point. Somehow, I never knew this. I've got to pay more attention. Already, there has been a drastic change in level design. The first chapter was very wide open and hard to play because of the substantial amounts of foliage blocking your vision. This chapter is more enclosed with branching pathways. There are more interesting environments too. Chapter 1 was mostly a forest with landmarks to guide your way. Nothing terrible, just boring. Chapter 2 has you going through showers, dropping down on pipes, going through an industrial area with biohazards, and a room with lasers. Far more interesting and engaging, and it plays well for the most part. When it comes down to balancing, my only complaint is the crescendo event and the laser room. The survivors have to open this door to proceed through the level, but the door needs power. Once the power is on, a horde will be summoned. After dealing with the horde, you now have to get through the door and disable the alarm starting the crescendo event. The problem with this is that there are two hordes back to back. And this isn't a random horde or a boomer puked on somebody. No, this is a <laughs> which can definitely drain you of your supplies if you aren't ready for it. And then you're expected to get through a moderately difficult crescendo event. I think this would have been better if these two hordes were spaced out more. It's not the end of the world or anything, just a minor oversight with balancing. My other complaint is the laser room. You've got to get across these lasers when there is an opening. Obviously, this is not bot friendly. The laser doesn't one shot you thankfully, but still. Bots will take free damage from this laser, and if they go down, it'll be messy. If there is a way to disable the laser, I'd like to know. If there isn't a way, I would have liked to see that because then you can appease the solo players and the co-op players. If you're playing solo, you should disable this laser to prevent inevitable damage bots will take. If you're playing co-op, you should just follow the pattern and get through to avoid wasting time. It probably sounds like I'm looking for things to complain about. And you'd be right! And even when I look for things to complain about, I can't find much. Those two complaints I have are very minor and barely affect the overall campaign. Compared to chapter 1, this is a very big improvement, but 
I cannot say the same about chapter 3. So, chapter 3. It's probably the worst chapter in this campaign, and I hate to say that because I wish I could say that about chapter 1. Chapter 3 is way more interesting and has more potential. The survivors discover a secret laboratory and find experiments being done on the infected. Not liking what they are seeing, the survivors decide to blow the laboratory sky high and escape through an elevator. That is a very cool story for a chapter, but it's all ruined because of two poorly designed sections. One where you go through a vent, and the other is an infinite horde. Now, when it comes to vents in the official campaigns, I can think of only two instances, no, one instance, where the survivors can go through a vent. The Tunnel of Love vent in Dark Carnival, and it's not even mandatory. And it's a very short vent. When you have to fight zombies in a vent, they cannot be shoved. This is why there are barely any vents survivors can go through. Shoving is one of the core gameplay elements of Left 4 Dead 2. Without shoving, the game literally changes. So let's look at this vent in Darkwood. Once you enter, Incoming! a magical horde just spawns in out of nowhere. There is no reason for it. What, were the infected smart enough to wait for the survivors to head into the vent and then ambush them while they are at a disadvantage? It's not even just a single horde, it's actually a crescendo event. A crescendo event. In a vent! Does that sound fun to you? Having to fight commons that you cannot shove at any time? It's a pretty tame crescendo event, but still. My problems with this section can be summed up like this. First, there is no context for the horde. Second, fighting zombies in a vent makes me want to cry. <laughs> now, on to the infinite horde I mentioned. For this, there is at least context. Survivors destroy the power core, which leads to an alarm, obviously. Then the map wants you to bomb rush into an elevator during an infinite horde with a time limit. You only get two minutes to make it to the elevator before the whole lab explodes. Two minutes? That's some bullshit! If you really think about it, you can barely afford any mistakes. I did a full run through without any zombies to see how long it would take. With green health, it took me about 50 seconds to make it to the elevator. Let's try that again, assuming that we're low on HP. This takes about a minute and 20 seconds. With zombies in the way, let's just add 10 seconds to both of these times. So, 1 minute if you have above 40 HP, and 1 minute and a half if you're below 40 HP. You can probably only afford 2 or 3 mistakes, at the least, in order to make it. To make matters worse, this chapter is one of the longest in the campaign. Dying to the explosion is highly probable, especially if it's your first time playing the map. Two minutes? Come on. Three minutes? No. Two and a half minutes. At the least. Whenever there are timed events like this, it needs to cater to as many contexts as possible. What if the survivors don't have grenades? What if there are already survivors dead? What if you have someone playing this map on Realism Expert Solo? Maybe you don't need to cater to those specific people, but at least cater to the first two I mentioned. I know the map is meant to be hard, but this timer is so strict that it ends up taking away value from the map instead of adding. It's unnecessarily strict. I know it sounds like I hate this part of the map, but I really don't. I like the idea of escaping an explosion that is imminent. It offers a sense of urgency and excitement that this chapter has been lacking. But it's not worth it if it ends up taking away from the map. I will give it this though. If you made it to the elevator with time to spare, it just goes up and the chapter ends. But if you make it to the elevator right before the timer reaches zero, you'll get this hidden cutscene where the elevator falls down right as the explosion occurs. I f***ing love when maps do stuff like this. Attention to detail that most maps don't care about or don't even bother to add. You know what? I changed my mind. Chapter 3 is better than chapter 1. While I do think that the vent section is complete BS and that the 2 minute timer before death is unnecessarily strict, I would still rather play that instead of the boring slog that was chapter 1. Chapter 3 isn't the best, but it's the most memorable in my opinion. When I think of Dark Wood, I think of Chapter 3. 
I think of the power core explosion. I remember my frustrations going through that vent section. None of this makes the map better, but it does make it memorable. And that counts for something, right? Speaking of memorable, I won't forget chapter 4 of this campaign either. That is why this chapter is memorable. If you made it to the elevator with spare time, this chapter will start with you falling to your death. If you got the secret cutscene, this won't actually happen. Thankfully, this glitch fixes itself the first time you fall, which is kind of weird. That is the best way I can describe this chapter. Just weird. The map starts out with you getting out of the elevator shaft. You don't even have to climb down the ladders. The map actually tells you that you can just jump off and not take fall damage. <laughs> Which I can appreciate because when it comes down to bots and ladders, you know, those two just don't match. So I'm thankful the map creator did this. After the survivors climb down the ladders, we... Uh, well, this is a drastic change. Remember when I said this chapter is weird? Yeah, the map turns into full Silent Hill mode. And don't worry, it'll get even weirder as we move on. Once you drop down this ladder, you're in a bad spot. Commons will be all around you, and special infected will start spawning in. There isn't a horde or anything, just a lot of background commons. As the survivors progress through the map, they are supposed to get on this elevator, but there's a catch. There is always a catch. Watch out, tanks! We died. Now, I'm no stranger to dealing with multiple tanks at once, but I'm ready this time. Let's try again. So, um... Where are the tanks? For whatever reason, the tanks were replaced with a horde of zombies this time. Did I mention that this chapter was weird? Okay, so there were two tanks the first time around. Why not the second time around? It's inconsistent, and it kind of rubs me off the wrong way. I would have been up to the challenge to fight two tanks at once, but whatever. Maybe the map just bugged out, or maybe it was intentional? I, I just don't know. It's weird. After going up the elevator, the survivors continue looking for a way out of this horrifying, blood-red, Silent Hill-like location. I do like the change of aesthetic. A little bit of horror never hurt anyone, am I right? <laughs> I've been saying that this chapter is weird. If what I showed you isn't enough to convince you, I'm sure this will. Look at this screenshot. What does this look like to you? If you've played Half-Life 2, you would know what this is. It's Nova Prospect meets Left 4 Dead 2. Now that is very weird. Normally, I would call the map creator out for doing this, but he did a very good job at altering the textures and some of the layout. It still feels like its own thing, even if it is using a different map from a different game entirely. It's actually quite fitting too, because Nova Prospect was one of the darker chapters of Half-Life 2. Fits with the theme this chapter is going for. It even plays well. The level design might be a little bit too tight at times, but it's not that big of a deal. Eventually, the survivors have to open a series of gates in order to proceed. This is one of the harder crescendo events because of how long this can take. There are a lot of gates that need to be opened, and the game does not do this for you. Every button has to be manually hit to open the gates. Some players might not know that. After the alarm is disabled, it's smooth sailing from here. After going up another elevator, the survivors are finally free until you realize there is one chapter left. This is definitely the longest chapter in, in the entire campaign, even longer than chapter 3, but I enjoyed it overall. It's better than chapters 1 and 3, but not as good as 2. I think this one would have been better if the map was consistent with that first elevator, and if the whole Nova Prospect section was replaced with something original. But other than that, it's still a good chapter. So, we've got one good chapter, one great chapter, and two mediocre chapters, but no bad chapters. Chapters, 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 that's gonna be stuck in my head now. This finale will decide what rating I'll give this map, and I have high hopes because I've got nothing bad to say about the finale of this campaign. It's not a spectacular finale that ends with a bang, but that's okay. Not every map needs to end with something huge. After escaping from Silent Hill, the survivors find themselves on train tracks, and then they find themselves in a catacomb, which is giving me Dark Souls and Skyrim vibes, but hey, I'm not complaining. After emerging to the surface, they discover a church with a rescue radio. The US military is apparently expecting survivors to arrive at this church in the middle of nowhere, though I must say, this is a pretty cool church. 
There is a saw blade trap in the middle that you can activate to kill zombies or your own teammates if you really wanted to. That is always fun. There isn't anything special about this finale. It's your standard holdout that lasts about 5 minutes. It doesn't pull any surprise stunts either. It doesn't pull out 7 tanks. It doesn't pull out 2 tanks doing a horde with special infected. It's just normal. And it feels weird to say that. After the 2 tanks have been killed, the rescue helicopter arrives and brings the survivors to safety. Except Lewis. You must continue your journey without me. What, 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 oh, oh, what are you, what? Chapter 5 as a finale is perfectly fine. I have literally nothing to complain about. So now, I'm going to give my overall thoughts and rating of this campaign. Between playing Hometown and Buried Deep, having a normal finale is something I can appreciate. Not to say that those other finales were bad, they were just very, very hard. And I, I know I'm playing on Realism Expert, I get that. But please understand that me playing on this difficulty has no effect on my enjoyment of the campaign. If anything, it makes me enjoy it even more. I'm a sadistic maniac, I know, but that is just how I feel. It's why I always play Realism Expert. I play it because it is hard, and doing something that is hard instead of easy is so much more satisfying. So now that I've got that out of the way, it's time to talk about stuff I didn't with Darkwood. There is versus support for this map, so if you ever had a group of 8 friends, you can try this map out in versus. It also has a single survival map, nothing crazy, but custom maps don't have to go the extra mile and add support to these modes, but this one did, and for that, it gets extra credit. There are also many secret easter eggs and weapons that I don't even want to spoil. These are very cool additions that once again, the map creator didn't have to go the extra mile for, but he did, and for that, extra credit is due. Overall, this campaign is an 8 out of 10. It's a great map that everyone should play. It's funny that I think so highly of this map because I used to dislike it. If you aren't aware, I played this map a while ago with 8 survivors and at the time I didn't think much of it, but after doing this review, I can see that this map is great. Chapter 1 and 3 are the only things holding this map back. And if those chapters ever get improved upon, this campaign can easily be a 9. But we'll have to wait and see. You are all right, Darkwood. You're all right.